Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and I like to help you learn how to write better and why language is fun. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the words sit and set, and a meaty middle about monster words. But first, support for this podcast is brought to you by Hanover Square Press, publisher of the book I'll Be There For You, the one about friends. Join pop culture expert Kelsey Miller as she relives the TV show's most iconic moments, examines some of its controversies, and shines a light on the many trends it inspired. It's the ultimate book for fans everywhere. If you love watching Friends, get I'll Be There For You today. Available wherever you get your books and audiobooks. Next, when I did a show about lay versus lie a few months ago, listeners wrote in asking me to do a follow-up show on sit versus set, because the problem with sit and set is similar to the problem with lay and lie. So here it is. Like lay, the verb set requires an object. You set something, the object, down. For example, I can set a book on the table. Or, if you want to get more abstract, you can set a date for an event. There is some object that receives the action of the verb. In my examples, it's a book and a date. On the other hand, like lie, sit doesn't require a direct object. It's something you do. I sit on the couch. Verbs such as set, which require an object, are called transitive verbs— And verbs such as sit, which don't require an object, are called intransitive verbs. The way I remember the difference is to think of transitive verbs as transferring their action to the object. I also have a good memory trick to help you remember the difference between sit and set. When you're training a dog, you tell her to sit. My first dog's name was Dude, and she was a girl, so we would tell her, Sit, dude, sit and she would plop her little bottom down. She was a good dog. She was a bull mastiff, so actually her bottom wasn't that little. So get that image in your mind of a big bull mastiff responding to the command sit. That's how you use sit, for the action of sitting. Set, on the other hand, requires an object. Sometimes I would move dude's leash and set it somewhere, but she would still think we were going for a walk. I know she saw me set it down, but that leash had moved and she was always full of hope. In those examples, the leash and the word it were the objects. I set the leash on the table. She saw me set it down. So the quick and dirty tip is to remember that a dog or person sits, and you set down things, objects like leashes. It's almost time for Halloween, a time for all things spooky and scary, and what's scarier than monsters? Today, we're going to talk about four normal words that are derived from the names of monsters and other mythical beings. Pull the blanket over your head if you need to. Here we go. You probably learned in fifth grade that the hippocampus is the part of the brain that helps us create and retain memories. But you might not know that it's named after a mythological creature called the hippocamp. This was the water horse in the classical mythology of Greece and Rome. The word comes from the Greek hippos, meaning horse, and campos, meaning sea monster. And indeed, the hippocamp had the top half of a horse and the bottom half of fish or dolphin. The hippocamp was said to pull the chariot of the sea god Poseidon, He even sometimes let Poseidon or other nymphs ride on him. Real-life seahorses look somewhat like the mythical hippocamp. Because of this, scientists named the genus that seahorses and sea dragons reside in hippocampus. Why does the memory region of our brains also have this name? Because it, in turn, looks like a seahorse. It's shaped like the letter C, with a chubby top and a long, curving tail. Next, we're going to talk about the chimera. Not the Camaro car, the chimera, spelled C-H-I-M-E-R-A. The chimera was another monster in Greek mythology. Its name comes from the Greek word chimera, meaning she-goat. It was said to have the head and front legs of a lion, the body of a goat, and the hindquarters of a serpent. It was sometimes shown with the heads of all three animals set along its body. 
In case you thought this ugly creature might get lonely, don't worry. It had a lot of siblings. There was the sphinx with the head of a human and the back of a lion. The hydra, a serpent with many heads. Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guards the underworld. And the Nemean lion, who terrorized the people of Nemea before being killed by Hercules. Because the chimera was such a fanciful creature, it was made of three different animals, after all. Its name came to suggest the impossible. Today, it refers to an illusion or an unrealizable dream. For example, a pessimist might say that having all humanity get along peacefully is just a chimera. Recently, this word has taken on a new meaning closer to its roots— In scientific terms, a chimera is a hybrid of two different species. Scientists create the hybrid by injecting stem cells from one species into the embryo of another. One goal of this research is to grow human organs in the laboratory to help sick people who are waiting for organ transplants. But the ethics of creating chimeras with both human and animal cells are still under debate. Let's move on to something more straightforward, the behemoth. You might have used this word in the past to describe something really big. For example, Amazon is known as a marketing behemoth, Apple a tech behemoth. The word comes from the Hebrew behema, meaning big beast. That, in turn, may have come from the Egyptian peihamu, meaning water ox. This monster is referred to in Hebrew, Christian, and Muslim texts. The King James Bible describes it as having a tail that, quote, moveth like a cedar, unquote, bones like bars of iron, and a mouth that can consume an entire river in one sip. In Muslim texts, the behemoth is referred to as Bahamut and depicted as a giant fish supporting the earth. How giant? One writer puts it like this, quote, If all the seas were placed in one of its nostrils, they would appear like a grain of mustard seed in the midst of a desert, unquote. Now that's a behemoth. Finally, another good way to say that something is really big is to say that it's gargantuan. This word came into English through French. That's because in the 1500s, the French author Rabelais wrote a series of books about two giants— Gargantua, and his son, Pantagruel. According to Rabelais, Gargantua spent 11 months in his mother's belly. Then he came out through her left ear, shouting, A drink! A drink! A drink! His throat was so large that his father exclaimed, How big yours is! That's something like que grantua in French. The people around him decided that the baby's name should therefore be Gargantua, which sounds a lot like Gargantua. The myth of Gargantua predates Rabelais. It's believed to be a Celtic myth that spread through France and Great Britain. The myth still lingers in France. There's a long hill in the Aosta Valley known as the Gargantua Finger, and there are valleys in the Loire region that are said to have been carved out when Gargantua threw a giant rock. And of course, his name lives on today in the adjective gargantuan, which means enormous or monstrous. So that's our meaty middle. Some normal-sounding words are based on monsters from mythology. Happy Halloween. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all the old Grammar Girl articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>